how many of you were here last year? Okay, so there's some, actually, significant number of new faces. You're going to get a chance to see something. My presentation is not called Epson, just so you know. Uh, you're going to get to see something really interesting today. We're going to talk about planets around other stars. Why? Because I'm an astronomer, and astronomers will focus on many things uh, you know, regarding the universe, and among them are these, these new things called planets around other stars, or exoplanets. Exoplanets. There they are. Um, and uh, I will let you know if you accidentally put the wrong talk up, because you, you put all of them up here. Oh, I do, didn't I? Yeah. Okay, well, you know what? We'll just keep going. If I see the wrong thing, we can blame her, because it'll be her fault at that, at that point. Okay, so how's my sound? Everybody hears me? And there's a little bit of ring I hear, but I know he's going to have a tough, tough time, because for part of my talk, I come off the stage. Because I hate podiums. I do not like podiums. Uh, the reason is it puts a blocker between me and you. I don't want that. You're here to hear someone talk, you're here to get involved and hear people talk, and you know, that transmission of information is very, very important. And to do it, I think you need to be right there, front and center with everybody. That's just me. What can I say? Old school. <laughs> so anyway, I'm an astronomer. This is what we look like. <laughs> okay, I even wore a tie today. Oh yeah. Black with a dark blue shirt. Okay, fashion sense might be a little off, but you know what, I'm getting there. Okay. In any case, um, when we talk about exoplanets, we, we have to ask the question, you know, why even bother looking? And my talk's a little bit interactive, too, which is which, uh, to a point. Uh, and I'll, when I ask questions, you know, if you want to answer, I'll ask you to raise your hand, you know, because it's not a class. But <laughs> it's definitely something where I like to hear from you as well. Okay. There's a reason we're looking for planets around other stars. And I would just like someone to give me one good reason. Just raise your hand. Just tell me if you have a good reason why we're doing that. Who knows? If you don't raise your hand in three seconds. No. All right. The answer is really simple. Obviously, we want to find other worlds like ours. And the reason is because our world is not forever. Our sun is going to die. Now, don't run home and pack although we only have five billion years. All right, but in that time, the sun will run out of the hydrogen fuel that powers it and allows us to get this radiant energy. And when that happens, we are going to have to vacate this planet and go elsewhere. Now you might say, well, can we go to Mars? Well, yeah, sure. I mean, uh, there's actually a way to terraform Mars that's on the table at NASA. Uh, and it, it has to do with uh, basically giving Mars a magnetic field that it lost. So how do you do that? Well, there's a million ways. But one of the best ways is to actually put a, a, a fake magnetic field outside of Mars that's between the Sun and Mars. And when you have the magnetic field here, the wake of that magnetic field will envelop Mars in this protective envelope like we have on our planet. OK, you can tweak that just down a little bit. I'm hearing that ring. And, and they're probably going to go, uh, you know, to it. So just a little, just enough so I can. I, I said, I said I'll talk louder, so I don't, I don't mind. Okay, better. All right, good. So if we can put Mars in this magnetic envelope, then we have a way to give Mars the chance to naturally terraform itself, just as a, a point of reference. So we see ways now to actually turn, say, outer planets into something possibly livable in the future. When the sun goes, it's going to swell into a red giant. That's one of the phases it goes through as it runs out of hydrogen fuel. And when it does that, it's going to swallow Mercury. It's going to swallow Venus. It's going to swallow the Earth. You know, or it'll be very close. Either way, the Earth is going to be a cinder. There's not going to be anything left eventually. So what do we do? Let's terraform Mars. OK, so you get out to Mars. But that process is only good for another you know, half a million years. And then you got to do it again. But this time, you got to actually leave the solar system. Because when the sun starts to shrink again, as it will, you'll have nothing left. So we look for exoplanets. We look for other Earths. Now we're talking. So the question is, um, if, we, if we're doing this to find other Earths, there's, a, there's something that we also want to do. And that's to answer the age-old question I uh, mentioned before, and that is, 
is there life out there? Well, we now know <laughs> in our studies of the universe that it seems very likely that water is everywhere. That's right. It's not just on Earth. It's in comets, of course. Many of you knew that. Most of you knew that. It's in Europa, Jupiter's moon. It's in Enceladus. It's in Saturn's atmosphere, okay? It's all over. It's Pluto. It makes up a, a great deal of Pluto, all right? So water is yeah, ubiquitous. It's everywhere. This is good news because we need it to survive. So we can always extract it from wherever we go, including Mars. Mars has tons of water. I mean, that's a figurative thing. It's not just singular tons. It's many hundreds of millions of tons of water on Mars. And who knows, with a raise of hands, who knows about the lake, the active lake found on Mars? That's right. I know you guys know because we talked about it, right? Under the south pole of Mars is a lake, an actual lake, water lake, under the south pole. It's you know, a mile down, but it's there. And it's not just, uh, well, water-soaked strata of rock. It's an actual lake. So that brings to the question, geez, maybe there's more elsewhere. It took 12 years to find that, studying just the South Pole of Mars. So maybe there's more secrets that Mars has yet to, uh, to provide for us. You know? So there might be life there, too. But that's a, just a planet in our solar system, and you know how it is. We want the big stuff. We want another planet far away around another star. Hey, that's the fun part, you know? So we focused, uh, we focused the search of life, uh, you know, the search for life based on looking for that element, okay? Carbon is very important. You're all made of it. Every single major compound is made of it on this planet. Carbon is the basis for us. We are carbon-based beings. Luckily, the universe is a carbon-based universe, too, actually. There's carbon everywhere we look in the universe. It's in comets, it's in meteorites, it's in other stars, atmospheres even, because stars make every element, as we'll see. So, we're based on carbon, and the thing is, that means we can look for other Earth-like worlds. What's Earth-like? Well, we'll talk about that. So, the question is, why would other life even look like us? And I know that most of you would think that they probably wouldn't look anything like us, and you're absolutely correct. The reason is very simple. The reason is very simple. It's that, that we look the way we do, exactly as we are, because of five major extinction-level events that occurred on this planet. The Permian period, 252 million years ago, there was a gigantic extinction called the Great Dying. It took about 10 million years for that to, also, to take place, by the way. The extinctions aren't like, bam, they're all dead. This was not sudden. It was a long term. There was an event, maybe an impact. I did a What on Earth episode. I don't know if you've seen me on What on Earth or NASA's Unexplained Files, blah, blah, blah. But on What on Earth, I did one particular episode that talked about uh, possibly finding this gigantic radar signature under Antarctica of an ancient impact. And if that's true, that could have been responsible. It was the right time period for what we call the Great Permian Dying, when 98% of all life on the planet was extinguished over 10 million years. That could have been the thing that precipitated it. That would be a great finding. Now, they're still working on that, so you know, who knows whether they're actually going to say that that's responsible. But if you think about it, when the Permian Dying occurred, there were mammals that were dominant at the time. Believe it or not, mammals were dominant. That's you, all right? And reptiles were less dominant. However, the Permian dying benefited the, the uh, reptiles. And then when the mammals uh, were subjected to the extremes of this, this particular event, they went into hiding. Bye, we'll see you again, 10 million, 30 million years. It took 30 million years for them to recover from that. However, during that time, the reptiles just blossomed, and we now ended up with the age of the dinosaurs. And then, 65 million years ago, you know what happened. That was when dinosaurs were rendered extinct by a massive meteorite or asteroid strike off the coast that's of the now Yucatan Peninsula. Okay, that caused 
the reptiles to fall under such duress that they actually retreated into the shadows and allowed mammals to rise again, and here we are. So a whole series of events occur, these cyclic events possibly, that cause, well, reptiles come to the top, then mammals come to the top, other animals come to the top, and that's why we're here, because of that most recent extinction event. Now, what might it have been like if that didn't happen? Hmm. Maybe we'd be talking to each other with yellow eyes and big tails, you know? You know admiring each other's scales or feathers, who knows? There might be intelligent reptile-type species in the universe that may have had a dinosaurian age, so to speak, and then ended up uh, progressing beyond that to higher intelligence. I don't know. But that's the question. I'm starting with this so you can think this through as we go. And you'll think of most excellent questions. I'm sure you will. You in the back, I'm sure you'll have the best question of all. Maybe. Yeah. So, knowing that we're searching for carbon, does it mean that we're kind of chauvinists toward carbon? You know? Some people say, well, I don't think that life has to depend only on carbon. Maybe silicon or something like that. Maybe, but guess what? Carbon is a very plentiful element. Carbon is something that will, is all over the universe, so most likely it's going to be a carbon-based life form. And you'll see what I mean in a little while. Now, the universe provides a lot of the building blocks of life that are also based on carbon in this, in this particular way. All right? They're delivered here by comets, meteors, and asteroids as these building blocks of life. Uh, and the Earth makes these building blocks as well, automatically. In other words, life as we know it is a consequence of a planet like this. A consequence, what does that mean? Well, it means that when we went to the Rosetta, this is uh, comet uh, Trimov Gersomenko. I know you all know that. <laughs> hey, I practice to say that. Trimov Gersomenko, 67P. Uh, who heard, who's heard of the Rosetta mission to, to the comet? That was a few years ago, right? Then, good. And this. This is actually a, an actual image of a comet, a real comet. Now, the Rosetta probe took this image. Now, that, that thing you see up, going off to the upper left there, that, that fuzzy thing, that's called a gas jet. It's outgassing. As the comets come near the sun, they get warmer, and the stuff inside, gas that's trapped inside, can escape. And when it does, you get, you get that all over the place. Add that up several million times, and you get a comet that looks like a fuzzy spot in the sky, and then you can see also some debris and stuff like, uh, I don't know how well you can see the laser, okay, but you see these little spots here. This is debris that's been thrown up uh, by, the, uh, by the comet. Well, that debris, add that up millions of times, makes a dust tail behind the head of the comet. This stuff here that you see, this, this, this uh, outgassing, this stuff ends up surrounding the head of the comet. And so from Earth, we just see this fuzzy ball light in the sky, Lots of this happening, surrounding the comet, so you can't see the, the, the nucleus unless you get inside of it like this did. And then leaves a tail of dust behind it, like you see over here, all this dust we were talking about. And as it goes through space, it's in orbit, it's around the sun, it leaves a lot of this dust behind, okay? Behind it, leaving a, basically a debris trail, you know? What a litter bug. Comets are really the worst litter bugs in our solar system, by the way, just so you know. I, I, caution against trying to prosecute them, though. <laughs> They're really kind of feisty. So when this comet uh, finally made it away around the sun, it ended up being smaller and smaller. Didn't go away. It's periodic. That's the P, okay, 67P, okay? And so when it comes back again, it'll look very different, all right? However, what's interesting about this comet, when we looked at its structure, is that it's more than half of it is made up of organic molecules. You're made of those, okay? This comet. So this is a natural occurrence probably in every solar system there is, every star system there is. And here we see it on parade with organic molecules galore. This is something that you have to imagine. Uh, at one point, a, a comet like this might have collided with our planet. And if that happened, everything in this comet, everything this comet's made of, was delivered to this planet, including all the water, you know, H2O, okay, all the other chemicals, things called tholins, a lot of different compounds, and of course, carbon, 
and, and other hydrocarbon stuff. So that is so, another, another way that we probably acquired a lot of these materials. Right? So meteors did the same thing. Right? This is the Murchison meteorite. Um, I actually have a piece of a similar meteorite. Uh, it's, it's all iron, and it's only about the size of the palm of my hand, but it weighs about six pounds. Okay, it's really a good weapon. <laughs> and this thing here, the Murchison meteorite, brought 90 of these life giving, or these, these, these uh, building blocks of life, 90 amino acids to this planet. That's really cool. You know, and this is a meteorite, a rock from space, all right? Which, by the way, does fall from space, now that we know that, you know? And so, the Earth itself also creates these building blocks. Now, how? Well, back in 1952, a guy named Stanley Miller and another one named Harold Urey came up with something called the Miller-Urey experiment. What's that? It's this. Well, what is it? Well, the Miller-Urey experiment was a setup that had a mixture of, uh, in a water cycle where they had a reservoir of water, they would heat it, and it would go over here, then it would condense on the inside walls of this other flask over here. All right? And this other flask over here is very important too, because you see there's a spark being let off in here. That's a spark gap, two electrodes bzz, 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 going on. That's how it sounded too, probably, right? <laughs> and when it did that, okay, we had these chemicals in here. Water is H2O, CH4, all right, methane, NH3, ammonia, H2, hydrogen, and then CO, carbon monoxide. Mono, one, CO2, dioxide, carbon dioxide, CO2. So this is what we think the early Earth's atmosphere looked like, had these components. Here's what's interesting. They let this experiment run for about a week, and after a week, they found that they had a whole bunch of amino acids sticking to the side of this flask as a little brown ooze the building blocks from which you're made, made automatically by the planet. That was a cool experiment. However, they also discovered something else. When, when, Harold, uh, when uh, Stanley Miller actually died in 2007, they found 22 plus, this says 20, but it's 22 plus amino acids in the vials that they had made that they never saw. So many more were made that were never even captured at the time. Isn't that cool? And this is again, all the stuff from which we're made. Now, uh, here's another oddity which will set you to thinking. Have you ever noticed that every single life form on this planet, everything above uh, uh, multicellular uh, little creatures like uh, microscopic creatures, every single one of them has something called bilateral symmetry, symmetric about the center. Now, you can immediately say, well, we're not that way. We only have one heart, okay? Right, that's internal. But externally, the way that we interact with our environment is through this, bilateral symmetry. Now that's every creature on this planet. Think about that. What does that mean? It means it's a template that the universe provides in some way, isn't it? It's a template. The universe provides uh, a life. We, we have DNA in common with many animals, of course. Uh, we have this bilateral symmetry. And you know, this bilateral symmetry, uh, you know, for all these the higher life forms beyond these things, uh, you know, the internal arrangement is different, of course, as we said. But the way they interact with their environment again, the way that they interact with the planet is through a symmetric manner. We don't have any pogo stick cows running around going, hey, you gotta milk me, you know, I mean, we don't have that. Okay, we could, but we don't. We don't. And there's a reason, and that's, again, because the template that the universe provides for carbon-based life on a planet kind of like ours, an ordinary planet around an ordinary star, calls for symmetric arrangements. Very, very important. And it's not just bilateral symmetry, incidentally, we have other symmetry as well, okay? We have radial symmetry, flower petals, right? In this starfish, echinoderms, these starfish are another one too. You say, well, wait, radial symmetry, but starfish actually are very interesting because starfish start off as larvae, right? And then they grow into starfish. And when they start as larvae, they're actually bilaterally symmetric as larvae. They start off symmetric with the world like we are, bilaterally but then they turn into five-sided symmetric objects, pentameral. Okay, that's a very interesting evolution in its own. 
see? Oh, and of course, they have limbs that regenerate. Trust me, medical science has been watching that for years, trying to figure out how to do it with us, you know? So this is really cool stuff. But we want to ask now, what does Earth-like mean then to us? Well, it means that we have to have a habitable zone, all right? That is uh, something that we'll talk about in a sec. We have to have uh, liquid water on the planet, and we have to have a stable star, all right? Now, a habitable zone is that Goldilocks zone that several of the speakers earlier had mentioned. Uh, and it's, for us, it's 93 million miles from our sun. Okay, 93 million miles, got it. That's where liquid water can exist around this particular star that's at this particular amount of radiative output, you know, the radiation coming from our sun. You know, it strikes the earth, it gets absorbed, it makes it hot, okay? Well, that amount of radiation means we have to be 93 million miles away to have water that can survive on this planet, reasonable temperatures, and, and if we have an atmosphere that can support life, it has to be at that distance. Our atmosphere can support life. Couldn't always. That early uh, Miller-Urey experiment didn't have oxygen in it, did it? It kind of did with carbon monoxide, with CO, right? but it didn't have oxygen. Where'd that come from? Well, we'll see in a little while. Right, but uh, for us, th that habitable zone is one, we call it astronomical unit, the 93 million miles. It takes seven minutes, by the way, for the light to reach us from the sun. And of course, it's moving at light speed, which is 186,000 and change miles per second. That's seven times around the Earth in a second, by the way. And even at that unbelievable speed, it still takes eight minutes for the light to get here from the sun. So you see, you can see scales are really immense here. Now, liquid water also has to exist, and that's something that uh, we, we can talk about it, you know, as we move forward, uh, and it's standing water, you know, like a lake or an ocean, because we come from there. How do you know that? If you were here last year, I, I mentioned this, I might have mentioned this, who remembers how we know that we came from the ocean? Who remembers? Anybody? Oh, you're so shy. Yes. Thank you. Well done. He gets a cookie. Okay. Oh, you didn't know we had cookies. Oh, <laughs> now we're going to hear some things from you, won't we? <laughs> Sue, run out and get the cookies. Um, you're absolutely right. Salt and, you know, NaOH, sodium, okay, and the oxygen and hydrogen, okay. Uh, sorry, NaCl, I apologize. I was saying sodium hydroxide, that's something different. Uh, sodium chloride, okay, NaCl, uh, the sodium atom and the chlorine atom. Actually, that's a natural byproduct uh, of water washing down land. Sodium atoms and chlorine atoms can wash away very easily. They can dislodge from strata very easily, but they also can combine in the water very easily as well. And it's sort of a loose combination, so they can actually be dissolved in water. So salt is the way. You look at yourself and you say, well, we have skin. Okay, what's that skin? The skin is containing a, an ocean within us. We are containing the ocean within us. It's a primitive ocean, isn't it? Because we can't remember when we were in the ocean. This was a long, long time ago. But when we, when we left the ocean and populated the land, we contained the salt within us because we couldn't go without it, and we still can't. You can't do without salt. So that said, um, you know, the fact that we're salty is the indicator to anyone who says that we are seeded here by alien life. You have to say, well, explain why we're salty then. You know, explain the salinity in our bodies, which is the salinity from the ocean. I don't, you're going to have to explain that one. That's sort of a biggie, you know. I believe in unidentified flying objects. I'll just say that here, you know. I mean, yes, it's a career killer when you say that as an astronomer, but, but you know what? Not really, because from a scientific perspective, I think they can be here, and we're going to get to that. So liquid water has to exist along with being in the habitable zone, all right? And being in a habitable zone could cause liquid water to exist because all the right conditions will be met. Lastly, we need to have a stable star. Our sun, believe it or not, is not the most perfect star for our lifetime, our life, uh, the creatures that live on this planet, actually. Well, go to the tropical side. Go for a tropical vacation. The sun never sets. It's always noon or 11 o'clock or 2 o'clock. The sun's always out. Your shadows never change. You can get a tan for as long as you want. Then you decide you want to go photograph sunsets. So you go over to this part where the, the sun is setting. It never changes. It's always in the same place. Photograph the sunset until you're blue in the face. 
Then you want to do stargazing. Now you keep going around the other side. And now, over four days, okay, you get to see the entire universe that it can see <laughs> in its year as you go around the star. And you'll see all the stars. I mean, this is a real estate tycoon's dream here. If we ever get there, okay? But we won't. Not, not in the near future. But the point being is that this location is really uh, fascinating because of the fact that it has three, you know, optimistically really, you know, or, you know, conservatively I should say, three potential habitable planets all in the same system. Let's suppose that life forms did arise, say, on F. They're labeled uh, with letters, okay, so B, C, D, E, F, G, and H. Uh, a is the star, so we don't talk about that, so it starts with B. So let's say F has life forms developed. They find out that E is habitable. I know they put up a colony on E. And then E puts up a colony on D. And now we have life forms on all three planets. See, in this particular evolution, the species of animals that develop here, if they reach intelligence, if they end up being something that can take advantage of the situation, have reason, if they can do that, they'd be way ahead of us in a lot of ways because they would have habitable worlds that they could colonize. We don't have those. We would have to make them habitable. So see, our system is not as conducive to learning about interstellar flight and getting out of here and going planet to planet as, say, this system. And these planets are all very close to each other. In your sky, they, they would be like, you know, as big around as a silver dollar in your sky, okay? or a 50 cent piece in your sky. So that, they're, they're pretty big. So that said, you know, I think that the debate continues you know, as to you know, whether uh, those three are habitable, but I, I have a feeling that we're gonna find that at least one of those planets, and that's ultra conservative, at least one will be in a position where it probably has an atmosphere that could be uh, converted to an oxygen atmosphere, if not now. And uh, you just have to get used to a real short year. <laughs> You know? And because it's tidally locked, um, you know, we're probably not going to get the same types of shifts that we do on Earth with seasons and so forth. It's going to be a very different situation. So anyway, I think that's pretty cool. But this is kind of what we suspect is here, you know, very hot up here. This one has, this little guy right here actually has 50 times the water that Earth has. 50 times, you know. This one might be rocky and rocky and likely frozen. If it's still habitable, it might be like Mars, you know, but maybe a little closer than Mars. And then these, of course, would be mostly frozen. So that's what we think. And this is a, a system that we've actually analyzed in, you know, quite in depth. So it's pretty cool. TRAPPIST-1, look it up. Two-piece, mm -hmm. TRAPPIST. So, um, so we know that this, we're made of these, these heavier elements that were formed in stars, okay? And then planets are formed from them. Now, we also know that these A-type stars we talked about, O, B, A, F, G, K, M, remember? At A and beyond, we can have planets. Uh, and the question is, how do we find those planets? Well, some of you know, I just mentioned TRAPPIST is a planet hunting system, but we also uh, have some ground-based things. I'm not gonna go through all this like this, this is just to show you. There's like, <laughs> there's 45 active ground-based planetary search uh, programs. These are just some of them. And this gives you the number of planets they found, but don't worry. Uh, the, the point is, I'll summarize it all for you in the end. There's a lot going on here on the ground and also in orbit. Believe it or not, the Hubble Space Telescope has made planetary discoveries. It's not designed for that, but we managed a way to do it, all right? And so, obviously, Kepler is, is here, along with K2, which is called the Kepler Extended Mission, and that'll figure prominently in a second, as I'll tell you. All right, so there's a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of potential. Now, one last thing I'd say is, uh, right here, this is, the big, this is the big line right here, and I just went right by it. Okay, for all systems, all uh, planetary hunting techniques, 3,772 planets confirmed have been found, all right? Some of which may or may not be like the Earth, okay? They're not, they're, they're not necessarily habitable planets, they're just planets, but there's also, 2,720 additional candidates. Now you might say, well that doesn't sound like a lot. I would expect millions of planets. You have to remember something, all right? You have to remember what they were looking at in the sky to come up with these numbers. How many stars were they looking at? And that's what we're gonna look at. So, 
Um, although it's, you know, the, the Hubble's not suited to it, but, you know, finding planets, but it found many elemental uh, uh, particulates in some of these planetary atmospheres, stuff that we want to know about, okay? You know, water, carbon dioxide, oxygen has been found in some of these other planets, uh, atmospheres, all right? And uh, now, does this indicate a commonality? That's just a good question, right? Is it common for these elements to be found elsewhere? And the answer is, yeah, it is. It is. All right, so in other words, remember what I said about templates, bilateral symmetry, okay? These are templates the universe provides. It's providing templates for these types of materials. I specifically chose water, carbon, oxygen, carbon dioxide, and methane because these are part and parcel to what makes us a successful life form and species on this planet. We have to have all these things, all right? And we see that they're common elsewhere. That's very important, okay? Now, how do we actually find the planets? Well, this is the Kepler Space Telescope. It was launched in 2009. It was actually brilliantly successful, right? And this is its uh, sensor. It's curved. This is the back side of the sensor. It's curved because when you're looking through a, a convex lens, remember convex is like this, you know, the bottom and top. It's sort of like a, a bulb, you know, bulges out on either side. Well, light coming through the edge of, the, of that lens is going to be angled a little bit differently than light going straight through the center. And you have to you know, understand that the curvature allows the light to focus uh, at all points. So it maximizes the, the use of the sensor. So that's what this curvature is. It accounts for something called Petzval radius curvature. Don't worry about that. But just understand that the curve is something that scientists take into account, and that, that focus difference is taken into account. I'll give you an idea. You've had cheap cameras. Every one of you have probably had a cheap camera once in your life. You take a picture of this beautiful thing. Do you ever notice it has like a blue fringe or a red fringe around it? Okay, uh, the picture didn't quite come out right because it had like a blue or red fringe around the building, the sharp edge of the building or whatever. That's the light not focusing all in the same place. So you get like a red fringe or a blue fringe typically, which shows that that light didn't quite focus. Well, that's what this sensor is for. The curve does that. The camera sensor is flat. It's not curved. If it was curved, it would all be sharply focused. Hey, that's just the facts, right? So, that said, what's the Kepler? Kepler had all this stuff on it. We're only going to talk about one thing in intentionally here, and it's the reaction wheels. These reaction wheels, what are those? Well, they're those. Okay, there's two here. You see they're on a funny angle, and then there's two over here. All right. Now, a little up close, we'll take a look at that. Um, I, took this pic I took all these pictures in, in uh, Arizona. I was working on a satellite project out there. Uh, and then it was at a time when I was doing uh, uh, classified work for the Navy, and this satellite was actually a classified satellite. Some of it was. This, this obviously wasn't. Um, and when I took these pictures, um, uh, you know, we had to be very careful. And so this, these, these things here are called reaction wheels. What are they? They're like spinning. Think of them as spinning weights. Okay. Now, if you have something that feels no forces from outside, something floating in space, if you spin a weight, okay, it's going to cause some type of force to occur on the object to move it. Example, you're an astronaut in space, and you fling your arm out like this. What's Newton's third law? For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So you do this, and your body goes like that. So in a sense, you'll go like this. This is lighter, so it can fling farther, but your body's going to twist to this side when you do that. It's an opposite reaction. Reaction wheels do that, but with a satellite and very precisely. By doing this spin, they, they have spinning weights. By spinning the weights up to a certain amount, they can make the satellite look anywhere they want. It's a very precise, very, very exacting science. That said, um, you have to wear this special garb whenever you work on these satellites. The most important thing in this picture is this, this cable. This cable is a grounding cable. Yeah, that's me. This is a grounding cable, and when you take this grounding cable, you have to plug into a rail before you get anywhere near the satellite. And the reason you do that is because any static charge from your feet, if it gets onto the satellite, it can blow out a $10 million component in a split second. And you won't know it until it got into orbit. You know, so the special garb is not optional. It really isn't. And so Kepler had, again, Kepler had these reaction wheels, all right? has four. It can operate on three. It lost two. Maybe because somebody didn't plug in right, okay? But it lost two. So what happened? 
It couldn't point anymore. The Kepler mission was now crippled. And that was like in like 2013, I think. And then in 2015, engineers figured out a way to use the energy from the sun striking the Kepler Space Telescope to help keep it aimed. And they recalibrated the remaining action, uh, reaction wheels. That's not the right way. They, they recalibrated the reaction wheels so that they would work with the sun's force that's hitting the satellite. What's that do? Well, it means that now they had their third wheel back. It was the sun itself. It was a constant force striking the satellite, and they used that with these other reaction wheels. Slower, but still worked. And it took till 2015 to get that to work. And when they did, what they did was they found that this technique brought Kepler back to life. And that became what's called K2, the extension to Kepler, which was the K2 we saw earlier, if you saw it. So these, the, the way the Kepler was, was designed to work was it was meant to look for these moments when the planet would pass in front of the star, slightly dim the light of the star, which you see there, the bottom, and then as it comes off the face of the star and continues to go in its orbit, going around the star, okay, we would actually see this dip and then it would come back up. Right? Now, this dip is called a light curve, and when we see this light curve, we can calculate based on a whole bunch of things here. We can calculate the size of the planet, the location, how far it is from the star, I mean, you know, and how fast it's moving across the star, and so forth. And that helps us actually figure out a whole bunch of things about the system. And like I said, there's a total of 5,000 so far with you know, 3,700 confirmed and 2,700 uh, you know, uh, that are, are, are standing by, being waited wait to be confirmed. And that's what Kepler looked for, was transits, all right? Now you say, well, wait, what if the, what if the star's like this? Or what if the, solar, the star system's like this? And the planets are going this way around the star, and we don't see them passing between us and the star. What if there's no transit going on? Well, we have other techniques for that, <laughs> okay? And so, and before we get to that, I'll just say this. Uh, when we talked about the, the small apparent number of these stars with planets that we found, well, you've got to keep in mind that Kepler is only looking at a fist-sized area of space that's actually directly over your head, uh, just about uh, right at sunset, okay, in the constellation of Cygnus the Swan. That's where it's looking, right? Kepler and K2 are looking at a little area of fist size, and they found, again, these, these thousands of uh, confirm, confirmed planets and candidates, all right, of which many are Earth-like planets, most likely. So that said, uh, there's a lot of these fist sizes, which I've said to you before, I think, a lot of these fist sizes all over the sky. So by extrapolating out, we can come up with some potential numbers for what we think we have out there. Uh, and we'll get to those. Now, this number here is uh, 2331. Uh, it, it varies. It's 27. Uh, or, or 37, rather, and there's another 2,000. These are rounded off, you know, big time. But you get the idea. The numbers, the numbers are changing because the science is changing, you know. So that said, there's other methods to find these planets. And when, again, if the star is, if the solar system, the star system is doing this, and we don't see a transit where it's going between the star and us, well, the star might actually be moving a little bit away from us and toward us if the planets are doing this, okay? Out of our view, they don't pass in front of the star, but as the planet's going around, okay, as the planet goes around the star, that's the planet, then you see that the, the star is actually gonna be pulled a little bit toward the planet and a little bit away from the planet. Why? Because the star is actually moving slightly in a circular pattern. As the planets go around the star, the star is reacting to that. The slight tug causes the star to move toward us and away from us a little bit. All right, and that's gravity at work. And that creates something called the Doppler effect. And the Doppler effect is something we've heard it with, with sound as well. The train goes by, you know, you step into a road, okay, you know. That's the Doppler effect. We see that here too, but with light. And when light's coming toward us, it doesn't have a pitch change, it has a frequency change. When the light's coming toward us, it gets crunched up toward the blue end of the spectrum, a higher energy. As it's going away, the waves are coming out and, and being dragged out, and it goes toward the red end of the spectrum, and we end up with this red light that's red coming from the star. That means that the, the uh, blue shift and red shift, as it's, caused, as it's called, 
I hate being that guy. I've done that so many times, you know. I, I know. I know what it's like. I sympathize. Um, the blue light and red light coming from the star will allow us to actually calculate information about planets that are causing this. And, I, and we do that. This is also used as a confirmation for the ones where we do see the transits, right? So everything can be a confirmation or a discovery uh, technique. We also have direct imaging. I talked to uh, uh, astronomer Dr. Michaud out at uh, uh, Kitt Peak, uh, not Kitt Peak, uh, Mauna Kea in Hawaii, asked if I could use his discovery image. This is a discovery image of the first, first ever star system besides ours that was ever imaged. And it was imaged in, it's called direct imaging. It's infrared, but direct imaging. So a telescope looking with infrared light on top of a mountain, okay, saw this. This planet right here, this is a black occulting disk. It's not a black hole, okay. It's, it's called an occulting disk. It blocks the glare of the star, which would actually have taken up far more than the entire, uh, this entire blue square had it been allowed to show. Yet, this planet here, is as far away from its star, which is in the center here, as Neptune is from our sun. That's a great distance, all right? So this means that uh, this being the first image is kind of a landmark because it now starts us on the path toward seeing planets that are closer to the star. It's one of the first images. Very important. Now, uh, besides direct imaging, okay, and if this works, Susan is not wanting to work. No, I'm just trying to move ahead. It wasn't working. It suddenly stopped. The laser works fine. You know, but when I do this... No. Can you go back one? Okay. Yeah, see, it won't... Now, it, it doesn't want to work now. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead one, yeah. I'll just work with it. Don't worry about it. This is another method, and there's a yellow line right here that's really faint, hard to see. This yellow line represents the diameter of our sun. What is this? This is the motion of the sun over decades caused by our planets circling the sun. This motion is something that is, can, be, can be measured, and by measuring the position of our own star or other stars, then we can actually see in the sky a measurement of the position that shows us that, hey, this star is moving, there's gotta be something around it causing it to move. All right? And this is called astrometry. It's one of the oldest and most error-prone methods for finding uh, possible planets. Okay? Again, please. Sorry. And the last one, this is gravitational microlensing. This, this is interesting because if you have a star way out here, and then a star here that has a planet going around it, then, and this is something that Einstein proved, right, with our own star. Okay? If the light from a star passes by the planet, as seen from here, the light will be bent, and it'll be, it'll be altered, and we can pick that up, and we do. When you look at a, what's called a lensed or micro-lensed star, it looks like a ring with nothing in the middle. That's actually starlight that's been manipulated and, and bent. So that's kind of cool. Ooh, it worked that time. Oh, thank you, it worked. Now, if you're interested in exoplanets, Okay, you can go to the Open Exoplanet Catalog online, it's free. And you can actually see planets. And if, no, I'm not gonna do texting or anything like that, but if you use and have an iPhone, if you have an iPhone, you can actually go and get Hano Rain's uh, application called Exoplanet, which I have. I've talked to Hano, he's a great guy. That's H-A-N-N-O. And you can actually see uh, the latest finds. You'll see here, I've got the TRAPPIST-1 planets listed here. You get all their information, you get a lot of scientific data, and you, it's, it's delivered in a layman's terms so that you're not going to get lost by looking at it. You'll get lost by some of the numbers and some of the way that they're calculated, but don't worry. It's, it's something that, you, you, if you want to learn about planets around other stars, this is sort of a good place to go. That and the Open Exoplanet Catalog, that gives you a list of all the ones that are there. This one is very descriptive, has lots of imagery, lots of places to go. You can even get a galactic map, zoom in on the galaxy, and rotate all around and see how it looks from that perspective. I mean, it's really, really nice, okay? So, when we talk about, uh, we go back to Kepler here, and we talk about all these exoplanets we're talking about. This, as of January 2015, all right, this is the list of Kepler candidates that were found, all the blue dots, just as of January 2015. 
And then as of July of 2015, this many more got added. So you see, it's going on and on and on. And we're going to get to the point, I'm sure, where we're going to stop looking for exoplanets and, and just start looking for life. Because it's going to be a foregone conclusion that there's life out there that's beyond us. I mean, it is now, for all of us here, in this room. That's why you're here. And I've told you that before. I remember that. But the fact is that, you know, after we get to a certain point, we're going to catalog as many exoplanets as we can because that's what we do, okay? But having done all this, we're going to start looking for those planets that actually have life. And we're learning that we have some ways of doing that, which is kind of cool, you know? Now, the Spitzer Space Telescope is what we have been using to locate life uh, elsewhere, to actually locate atmospheres of planets. And when we look at the planets, okay, we look at, you know, the infrared energy coming from these uh, objects that the Spitzer looks at. The Spitzer is a small space telescope, okay, small, right? This one, on the other hand, is big. This is the James Webb Telescope. This one, I, I keep updating the number. Um, you know, when, when Spitzer gets up, you know, that's why it's in parentheses. Now it's 2021, okay? Uh, I thought it was going up in 2019, so did they. <laughs> okay, and then they said 2020. Then they said 2021. Well, even if it doesn't go up to 2029, I haven't heard that yet, <laughs> okay? Once this gets up there, it has a 21-foot mirror, as you can see here. Spitzer only has a 2.8-foot mirror. This, is, this guy has a 21-foot mirror. So that means that we're going to have a huge amount of capability. This instrument is designed to look at the atmospheres of exoplanets, designed to see the planets themselves, not as dots, but the information coming from the star and planet combo. It's going to be able to take that and decipher what the planet's doing. Why is that important? That's very important because if we look at the uh, the conclusions, okay, we have, this, this is true, we have perhaps 25 million at the low end and up to 10 to 20 billion other Earths, not planets, Earths, okay, that are inhabitable zones within our galaxy alone. And oh, by the way, there's two trillion galaxies. <laughs> so, now you'll raise your hand. How many people think that life is inevitable elsewhere, right? I'm pretty sure that that's going to be the case, okay? But I'm going to tell you something. Way back in the 1990s, Carl Sagan, my favorite astronomer, he said that when the Galileo probe was going to Jupiter, he said, I want the probe to look back at the Earth, and I want this probe to tell us, tell us what the Earth looks like with vegetation. That's a very important thing. You know, and we are only getting started, okay? Now, we have this technology now to figure out if life exists on an exoplanet. We have it now. How do we get it? When Sagan asked that Galileo look back at the Earth, they looked at a vegetated planet. And when they looked at our vegetated planet, they got what's called a reflectance index. What's that? The amount of reflection, basically. And basically, by doing that, it started an entire process where they began creating a database of reflectance for our planets. And they figured out different vegetation has different reflectance, different uh, uh, densities of vegetation will give us different reflectance. So now we have a database. So we know that for certain reflective indices, we know that when we look at an exoplanet with the Webb telescope, if we see a particular reflectance, we know, guess what? There's probably plant life there. And by the way, we can probably even guess the density. And the Webb telescope can also look at the atmosphere. Well, we would expect if that's true, then we should see oxygen in the atmosphere. All right? We should see CO2 in the atmosphere. We should see other elements in the atmosphere, components in the, element in the atmosphere that are things that we see on our Earth. Because it turns out what we've got here is probably relatively common. Yay! Yeah, right? I mean, that's very important. So it's really important, and, and with Landsat, you've heard of Landsat. There's been Landsat for many, many decades, flying around and orbiting the Earth, taking pictures of different vegetation in different lights, infrared and so forth, and it all looks different, all right? We've built a database that shows all these, difference, all these differences, and now that's available to us. 
and we're going to be using this with the Webb telescope as well. That is the most important thing. So what might we find? Well, we only know one planet with life. It's us. All right? And to understand, okay, to understand how life may develop and where we might be on that scale where, say, an alien species discovers us, well, that takes something else. We have to talk about something else, okay? Uh, and to understand how that timeline of life works, okay, I have something to show you. Now, I know some of you are familiar with this little black bag. And when I open it, I'm going to take out a very, very important uh, piece of uh, apparatus. It's very fragile, and I want you to, you know, those that help me got to be really careful with it because it's very, very sensitive, okay? and expensive, okay? It's a roll of toilet paper. <laughs> That's right. What have I got on here? I'm going to join you now. This roll of toilet paper is very important because when we talk about the timeline of life on Earth, we ask, what does that mean? What's that timeline mean to us? How did we come to be? And, thank you. Oh, oh, you're all here. I thought you were gone. <laughs> thank you. So we ask, how did we come to be? And the answer lies on this 117-foot roll of 298 sheets of toilet paper. How is that possible? Oh, I'll tell you. Are you going to be my, you're going to be the formation of the Earth? It's written, I have, no, first of all, I've got to tell you, um, obviously it's not a real roll of toilet paper. I did use a real roll of toilet paper in the beginning. Those of you that saw this last year, you saw this roll, but this has now been edited, added to. I've got all kinds of new stuff on this. So prepare to just, well, either be bored out of your minds or enjoy it. <laughs> because this is something that I did by hand. I drew all these sheets. Every four inches, I drew the vertical lines. 117 sheets worth. I have no life, as I've said to you before. <laughs> but, but that's the way it is. So. Let's start with sheet 298. That, that, that's good right there. That, that's really good, actually. So here on sheet 298, the Earth forms. Yay! And then a few sheets later, okay, at 4.5 billion years, we have the formation of the moon. Now, it's controversial, I know. The moon formed off of the Earth. The, 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 the overriding theory is that a Mars-sized object struck the Earth in its infancy, and it blew a chunk away that became the moon. Now, it wouldn't have become a round object blowing off the Earth. It would have become a bunch of debris that became a ring around our planet for a period of time that ended up coalescing into the moon eventually. So it stands to reason that the object that was blown off the planet should consist of whatever the thing that impacted the Earth to begin with was and the chunk of the Earth itself that was blown off, right, to become the moon. So it should be those two things. Well, it's not. <laughs> Science is never easy. It's not. The moon is more like the Earth than anything else. So it's kind of hard to, to, I guess, it's kind of hard to actually accept that the moon was made from a collision by this other object. Yet we know that that's probably most likely. So now we have to figure out a way by which the composition of the moon that we see is mostly Earth composition. Believe it or not, the moon is almost like us, except for you know, no atmosphere, the, the core is solid. Who've heard, who's heard that, and I heard this by several, from several people, the, 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 the experiments where the moon rang when they did the seismic stuff, right? Okay. Now, that ringing has brought a lot of conspiracy theorists to the forefront, because they've said, wow, that, why would the moon ring like that unless it was hollow? If you tried to take a ping pong ball or, or a large, uh, large uh, sphere that was solid versus hollow. Hit it with a hammer and see how long it takes for the ring to occur and, and, and perpetuate. You'd find that the solid object would ring for far, far longer than the hollow one. It's physics. So if you think about that, what that means is the moon is solid, not hollow. And that's actually proof because it rings like it did. You know, and that tells us that the moon's core is not molten any longer. Uh, it's probably, uh, you know, cooled down to the point where it's just hard. Don't worry, I'm going to go a lot faster, I promise. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, you were thinking, I know. <laughs> All right, so 
All right, so we're there, and we move on now. And now we're at, this is sheet 284. This is where we find the oldest earth rocks, zircons, 4.4 billion years ago. Who's heard of that? I mean, that was actually in Scientific American and a few other articles. Okay, zircons are the oldest, and we were able to date them. Now, you might say, well, how do we even date these things? And you might think carbon dating. Yeah, that's good to a few, ten, you know, just over 10,000 years. But how do we date stuff like this? How do we date the rocks? How do we, you know... We date the rocks by understanding something called radioactive decay. Our planet in the core has got a lot of radioactive elements. These radioactive elements are what give us a lot of the heat in our core. It's what keeps the core, you know, hot. It's what keeps the outer core molten, all right? Now, because of the pressure in the core, it's, it's, it's solid. But the thing is, when we talk about, uh, and that's just one thing, primordial heat left over from the formation of the Earth is another reason why it's hot. But if we look at the radio radioactive elements that are in the core, we understand from this and from radioactive elements in our crust about what's called radioactive decay. It takes a certain amount of time for a certain type of uranium, an isotope they call it, to decay from one volume to a different volume. By knowing those numbers, we can calculate by decay how old rocks are based on what they were versus what they became over time. So that's how we actually date these oldest rocks. That's, that's actually very important, you know. That was good, Tom, that was fine. That was good to have that light on. The, the ones out here, yeah, these are good. You, you get those on? Great, thank you. Woohoo! <laughs> Round of applause for Tom, yay! Thank you very much. So now, at, at this point, this is, two, this is 4.2 billion years ago, Okay, this is sheet 272, <laughs> okay, out of 294, 298. This is where the oxygen, or where the atmosphere actually built up, not oxygen, the atmosphere. We started getting a lot of uh, crust on the surface of the planet, and then volcanoes would erupt, and we would end up with a tremendous amount of carbon dioxide, sulfides, and other hydrogen gas, methanes, and so forth. And water vapor, where does it go? Well, it goes into what, at that point, we call the exosphere, because we didn't have an atmosphere. It's the area around the planet that became the atmosphere. And it went in there and it populated over time, and that's what this started happening here. It's a natural occurrence. You can't stop it. You know, you wouldn't stop it. And it would happen everywhere we go, you know, on any planet, anywhere in the universe. So now, we come along, and you'll see that uh, I'm going to... Oh, no, no, you stay there. Because if you follow me around, I'll never get done rolling anymore. you got to stay right up there. You know? Actually, hand him the end, and then you can be the corner. Let's see if you're anything interesting over here. Let's find out. No, you're just going to be a boring blank sheet. I'm sorry. <laughs> I do want to uh, thank Susan, by the way, for putting on a wonderful conference. She does it with Tom and Willie Miranda. Let's please thank her. She's done a fantastic job. And as much as I joke around, you know, love her to death, she's been very, very kind to me over, over the years. And that just ended, I'm sure. <laughs> so anyway, we keep going. You'll notice that you now we're up to sheet uh, 222, and we're still seeing nothing happen. Remember, the buildup of the atmosphere started way out there. So we kept coming around here, coming around. Oh, oh we missed one. Back here on sheet 220, a very key thing happened. The first bacteria on the planet, okay? First bacteria. That's actually fairly early in our planet's history. You'll notice though, well you maybe can't see from the cheaper seats, which will become actually the premium seats when they get around to you, okay? But in, in this case, you'll see that I did not put a date on that. Well, there's a reason. There's a debate whether bacteria formed at a certain point in our history and where in our history. Some say 3.2 billion years ago, some say 3.8. I just avoid the, the, the argument. I say, look, it occurred right around here. Okay, if it was 3.8, it'd be a little farther. You know, 3.2, a little closer. This is the happy medium. I'm happy with that. All right, so those are very important. Why? At the time, we had a lot of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Our atmosphere was 90 times denser than it is today. By the way, that's the density of Venus's atmosphere. 90 times denser, okay? But because of our location around our sun, we were able to bleed off some of that 
that density through processes that could exist because the temperature was a little bit more amenable. Cyanobacteria couldn't exist. We're not going up. No, I'm going to stay down here with them. I'm not going to go up there. So cyanobacteria are actually carbon dioxide gobblers. They would actually take in the carbon dioxide excess in our atmosphere, making it, in part, up to 90 times denser, as I said. And guess what they feed back? Oxygen. So you're breathing bacteria poop. Yeah, I said it. And it's true. That's the truth about these cyanobacteria. I'm, I'm OK with that. It's keeping me alive, you know? And again, oxygen in an atmosphere, I, I, some of you may know this, oxygen in an atmosphere is something that doesn't want to be there. OK, look at Mars. Mars had a lot of oxygen at one point. And because it lost its magnetic field, well, then, of course, the, the solar rays could obliterate it and make it you know, separate from water molecules, where it mostly was. And the hydrogen got lost to space. The oxygen went down into the planet's surface and started combining with other elements in the crust of Mars. So if you look at Mars, it looks kind of ruddy brown in color. That's because it rusted. The oxygen rusted Mars, and that's what it is. It's a rusty planet, iron oxide. You know, a really, really fascinating uh, you know, evolution on Mars. So cyanobacteria here on this planet uh, perform a fantastic role. They gave us the ability to oxygenate our atmosphere, and they kept oxygen oxygenating our atmosphere as time went on. Even though the oxygen wanted to come out of the atmosphere and combine, and it did, with many different uh, you know, crustal components. Even so, they kept replenishing it. And guess what? We're going to look for that when we look for exoplanets. We're going to look for oxygen in an atmosphere. And we're going to say, hmm, is this atmosphere thick enough with oxygen such that it's being replenished? And if we see that, we will know that there's life there. And if we look at the reflectance profiles I told you about, and we see that it matches a lush jungle, hey, that's a win-win. Then we know we've got a life-bearing planet there. All right, so you see, we're learning. We're getting a lot of techniques. You know, and we're moving forward, ever forward, in time and in science. So you'll notice as I go forward here and crash into all kinds of tables, trip, fall, and have you laugh, um, that there's a lot of delay here in anything happening. Okay, this is a little bit of tape because uh, some people got a little rambunctious holding it and, you know, tore it a little, you know. Well, it was toilet paper and originally it was very easy to tear. So as it comes across now, if we move this way, all right, again, not a whole lot happening for a lot of years, all right. And Marilyn's going to help me here because she's right at this point. Oh, you know what you are? You are the buildup of the oxygen atmosphere. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> this means to use a lot of oxygen. And I know her husband probably would probably have something to say to that. You know, she hosted me actually at a meeting uh, a couple months ago, actually. It was very nice. Yeah, very nice. Very, very, very hospitable. So at this point, this was 2.7 billion years ago. Yeah, we're still in the billions. OK, but this is where the oxygen atmosphere got to a point where we, we could see that it was building up. Now, how? You know, and, and maybe you think this, maybe you don't. How do we know what level the oxygen was at that time? Isn't that kind of important to understand? Well, we know that because certain molecules that we find in rock strata can't exist unless there's a certain percentage of oxygen. So when we find these molecules in these rock strata, we know that they had like 33% oxygen. We did, actually, at one point. We, you know, just before the Permian period, we had 33% oxygen in our atmosphere. Now we're at 21, okay? It's dropping, too, by the way, just out of curiosity. Nothing to worry about. Well, they don't know. Anyway, uh, is this on? <laughs> no. So that's at 2.7 billion, uh, billion years ago, that's when the oxygen level reached a point where it was actually building up to a point where other life forms could evolve. And oxygen is sort of that, that linchpin. It's that magic linchpin. And things started to happen fairly rapidly. Okay, Now, 2.5 billion years ago, we started to see uh, Proterozoic life at that point. That was beyond the cyanobacteria, which is way down there, you see? <laughs> okay, And that took all this time. And this was the, what's called the Archean era. And this is uh, 
again, two and a half billion years ago, we weren't there. But again, fossil structures and dating of molecules tells us all the information that, that helps us with this. Moving farther along on our timeline here, uh-oh, I don't have a corner. Uh, then we have, uh, let's see if, uh, you, 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 you want to be my corner? I'll be your corner. Ben Eno, everybody, he's going to help me with it being a corner. Thank you, Ben. Oh, this, this, hold that part. What if I said no? I, mean, I would have not said your name. Loudly and with applause. <laughs> but as we come around the corner now, we're still, we're, we're down to 100 uh, sheep, well, 126, all right? And again, we have from that point forward where the Proterozoic life was, I know you got to crane your heads, but don't worry, it'll be over soon, <laughs> okay? As we come around the corner and we keep progressing, look at a whole lot of nothing apparently going on. And this is the part of the Earth's development that I find the most fascinating because there's a couple things that happen here. First of all, I'm really impressed that I get the toilet paper in my audience and they love it. <laughs> On the other hand, it's really impressive to see how much time passes where what looks like nothing is happening. Yet, the little cyanobacteria way down there are still in existence today, doing the same job they've ever done. From way down there. Incredible. So they're little percolators doing their thing all the way through time. All through time. There's a number of really cool developments, too, that have, occur have occurred. Now, right here, uh, I put this in. This is kind of an important one. This is, a, this is the formation of the first supercontinent on the planet, Rodinia. Now, you've heard of Gondwana land. Yeah, that's not the way down there somewhere. This is Rodinia, OK? Now, this was uh, 1.4 billion years ago, and it's <laughs> It's a very important development for a number of reasons we'll get to. But as we see, a lot is going on here. And with the emergence of Rodinia, at this point, 1.2 billion years ago, we have some of the first known animals on the planet. Now, we don't call protozoans and, and algae animals, per se, but so more multicellular okay, was occurring around here. That's really important, too. I mean, it's all important, right? We're here. If we weren't, if none of this would happen, we wouldn't be here. So obviously, it's all very important. So I'll stop saying it's important. You know that. <laughs> now, as we keep going, and I don't crash into these absolutely wonderful comic books that you produce, make sure you check these out. OK, these are so cool. And we keep going, all right? The first earliest animals are here, out there. And now, as we come to sheet, uh, my own writing is tough sometimes, 51. Okay, this is where the breakup of Rodinia occurred. All right, and this was 800 million years ago. What does that mean? What breakup? What do you mean? This is where plate tectonics, the movement of the crustal plates, started to occur. Which, by the way, is another reason why the Earth is not so good a place for us. Okay, there are planets out there that are called superhabitables, and we're not one of them. You exist in spite of the fact that all this bad stuff happens on this planet. We get ultraviolet radiation, melanomas, I had one, you know. I mean, we have, you know, all kinds of strange diseases. We have, you know, earthquakes, tornadoes. There's planets out there that we think might not have any of that. Very, very stable. And they're called super habitable. I want one of those. Get one for Christmas. <laughs> I have a small one, I, you know. So honestly, something like this, when we talk about, you know, plate tectonics, that was actually really important for us. Because plate tectonics caused a lot of other things. It, it changed our atmosphere. It changed where life developed. It caused the transition from sea to land of different creatures as, as continents split. Any land creatures would, would now be trapped long term on their little spit of land that they were on. Now, that spit of land might have been 4,000 miles in size, but they're separated by water. And when you look at the history of, of species on this planet, you find that there are some species that existed in South America but also show up in Australia. Well, they didn't swim. No, they developed independently. So they, they actually ended up being independent branches that went in their own direction but came from the same common ancestor thousands and thousands of miles apart. Now, when we look at it. But that's not how it always was. See? And that's what I think is so cool. You know, and this, this planet's got all that for us and more. It's like, it's like I'm selling Earth or something. <laughs> it's like, come to Earth. Come see the, the magic, mystery and fun. So now, so this was 800 million years ago, the, the breakup of that supercontinent. And now, uh, the, this is 700 million years ago, 
additional multicellular organisms made their way to the stage. Okay? Additional ones. Now, moving forward again, and this was, again, this was uh, sheet 45. I won't quite get all the way around. I went up to center aisle another year. That was fine, but then I had to keep doing this and doing this and looking at both sides because I don't, like, I, love, I don't like having my back to anyone. Sorry. <laughs> it's not, not good. It's not good. So now if we come to here, this is sheet 35. At this point, this is 544 million years ago. The Precambrian era. Remember the Cambrian era? You learned about it in grammar school for sure. You know, they talked about the different eras of the dinosaurs, right? Cambrian, Ordovician, Devonian, blah, blah, blah. Okay, well, this is 544 million years ago. This is when the Cambrian era began, basically. And this is where the earliest organisms that use shells existed. Think about that. Organisms that used shells, that developed shells, calcium shells. A shelled organism is a very specific creature, probably for a very specific point at the, in time where it was needed. Evolution selected that as a successful path for life. All right? And it happened 544 million years ago, and we still see them today. Very successful. Right? Different kinds have passed and gone on, you know, and, and, and branches have ended and proceeded with others. All right? Now, when the Cambrian ended 510 million years ago, we ended up going into the uh, or, uh, Ordovician era. Okay? Now, the Ordovician era was an era where we actually ended up with some of the earliest fish. All right? And that was uh, 490 million years ago. I, I should probably, you're probably thinking I should know all these numbers by heart, right? Trust me, I edit this thing. So I have to look at it again and say, like, oh yeah, I wrote that yesterday. <laughs> You know, I had I the latest data on this all the time. You'll, some of you probably recognize if you're sharp, you already know we've talked about things that weren't here last year. There'll be a test. No, I won't. <laughs> Just kidding. Now, um, sheet 29 is interesting, too, because this is a very, very important point. 450 million years ago, and I said I wouldn't say important anymore because it's all important, but this is actually crucial. 450 million years ago, for those in the back here, which are now the prime seats, see, I told you, okay? <laughs> This is where early land plants began. This means the land was being colonized by plants. Well, and where was it, you'll say? Well, in the ocean, plankton, which, by the way, accounts for 50% of the oxygen generation on our planet. Did you know that? Plankton makes 50% of the oxygen. What's the other 50? Well, land plants. Now, okay. So. This is where early land plants colonized. And a lot of things happened at this point. This means that now land plants had their own niche they're filling, and they spread like wildfire. And when they did spread like wildfire, guess what else happened? Animals that utilized those plants spread like wildfire, found new niches to exploit the plants on the land. All right? That we'll see in a second, is a very, very important development. Well, there we go again. It's a development that's really cool. Right, now, uh, where the Silurian era begins is where the Ordovician era ends. But the Ordovician era ended with an extinction event, a global extinction event. All right. This global extinction event killed 86% of all the species on the planet. 86%. Those species never to be seen again. We only have fossils. I have some. They're unbelievable creatures that if they were alive today, you'd probably go, ah! you know, they're frightening looking. And they really do look malevolent, I'm telling you. Really, really evil things, you know. But they had to be. They were specialized, char you know, they were specialized characters at the time, you know, to, to handle the environment. So now, uh, 408 million years ago, the Silurian era ends, a little narrow area, and then the Devonian actually uh, uh, takes over. And this, 400 million years ago, is when we see the first insects, first insects. That brought rise to a few other things, which we'll get to in a sec. Um, now, when the Devonian extinction occurred, that, that was actually the end of the Devonian era, the Devonian extinction occurred, 75% of all animals on the planet died. 75%, 86%, 75%, that's the blue. You know, big kills are in blue. <laughs> and so that was uh, 340 million years ago. And this is actually where reptiles started to come about. 
the first reptiles occurred at this point. All right? Now, moving forward again, and not colliding with anything, uh, 280 million years ago, this is where Pangaea formed. Just so you have little indicators to where that might have happened, this was Pangaea right here. Okay? Pangaea is very important to us because obviously we had Rodinia. Rodinia broke up, we had plate tectonics, and then Pangaea kind of coalesced and formed. All right? And then it kept happening that the plate tectonics never stops. You know, land is built in the mid-Atlantic zone. It courses across and goes down into the Pacific. Okay? It goes down under the Pacific plate. So the North American plate subducts under the Pacific plate. That's why we have the Pacific Ring of Fire. Because wherever you get that subduction zone, where things go, where the plates go underneath another, we get volcanoes. And that ring of fire perfectly outlines the Pacific plate. It's really fascinating. I'm looking forward to climbing a volcano someday. I haven't yet. And I haven't decided which one I want. There's one in New Guinea. There's Erta Ale, uh, uh, you know, in Africa. I just haven't decided. Maybe Old Doño Lengai, which is a little, it's called a, a, a silicate volcano, a very low temperature lava. It's only about 900 degrees. Yeah, I mean, I ever get the chance. But, you know, I had, almost had a chance to do a, the, the science and data collection for a book on volcanoes. And it would have taken me all over the world to collect stuff. But then I probably wouldn't be here doing this. I would have been missing fingers. I would have burned them off probably collecting lava. I, I'm clumsy that way. So Pangaea formed 280 million years ago. All right, here on uh, sheet 18, we're getting close, okay? And now, you'll notice something's happening, okay? I'm not moving as far <laughs> in the auditorium to do the next thing, am I? And there's a reason for that, okay? Life is starting to explode. Things are starting to accelerate, all right? That's what we're seeing here. So, um, the Permian era came to an end here, all right? This is only on sheet 15. Look all the way to the beginning, okay? 15, this is uh, 250, uh, 200, uh, this was like 242 million years, it's, I say 245 here, but it's, uh, it's like 242 million years ago is when the Permian extinction occurred where 98% of life died, okay? Uh, this says 96%, that was my typo, it's actually 98%. Now you would think, well, how could a planet survive that? Well, we did, we did. At this point, when the Permian extinction occurred, two things were happening. We had, uh, we had mammals, and we had mammal-like animals, and we had reptiles, okay? The reptiles were actually inferior to the mammals at the time, okay? The mammals were synapsids, and the, and the reptiles were seropsids. Now, that's just the name, but the seropsids, the reptile-like creatures, when this extinction occurred, they were not as negatively affected as the mammals were at this point. Remember I told you how mammals had to retreat into the, into the shadows at one point? This is where it happened, all the way from there. Okay. So this is where the, these uh, synapsids actually had to retreat. Mammals had to basically take a second seat. They were dominant. They were the dominant life form on the planet at that point. But 98%, the extinction event that took 10 million years to occur, took its toll, and they suffered the worst. Mm -hmm. They suffered the worst. And so, seropsids rose to power. That's why, we, as I said, we had the age of the dinosaurs. This is where it happens, right here. That is part of our history. And we can't ever say, you know, that it's not, unfortunately. So now, um, when the Permian ended, the Triassic era began. Uh, the, the, the Triassic uh, began about that, that time. It says, I'll say 245 million years ago. And then what happened at the end of the Triassic period, which was here, and we do put the borders of our periods like this, where there were extinction events in some cases. Right? When the Triassic ended, there was an extinction event. All right? And that's what caused it. Now, this wasn't as big as the others. It was only 80% of all life died. Just take 80% of you, and, and what's left is what would have survived. I mean, that's, that's significant, you know. And 80% died now, and this is where the Jurassic era began 208 million years ago, all right? And when this happened, something else happened here at this point. Remember I talked about the plate tectonics still happening, right? Well, this is where the Atlantic Ocean, 200 million years ago, this is where it first opened up from plate tectonics. We never had an ocean, the Atlantic Ocean, until this. 200 million years ago is when that Atlantic Ocean opened up like that. That's very cool. Now, 
Um, 180 million years ago, we had early birds and mammals. Okay? Early birds and mammals were very important because it shows that the mammals were finally coming back. It took tens of millions of years for the mammals to recover from the Permian extinction. All right? Tens of millions of years. But they did. And when they came back, they came back in droves. Well, we know. We're, we're here. <laughs> okay? But the most important development is 150 million years ago. 150 million years ago, this was where flowering plants formed. You gotta tell me, I, I, I'm not gonna continue until someone can tell me why is that important. You gotta be able to figure this out. Yes? Food is very important, okay, that's true, all right, I can't take that away. But flowering plants. Oxygen? Oxygen was cyanobacteria, but that's true also. No, see, you're gonna get it all right, yeah. Oh my gosh, give another cookie. <laughs> Pollination. Remember I talked about insects that take advantage of the land, remember that? Back there, you know, we, I said land animals would take uh, advantage of the, of the uh, emergence onto land of the plants, remember back there? This is where it occurred. It took that long from maybe over there to get to here, and this is where pollination occurred at this point. This is how we got what's called diversification of species, all right? Radiative adaptation occurred. That's where, you know, it radiates out from one central ancestor to a million different types of ancestors. This is where that diversity occurs in the plant world, is when pollination occurred, because that became a mechanism by which a lot of different creatures took advantage and was able, were able to get food, nectar, and other, and other food that would actually be used for other processes to keep them going, see? And that's where it happened. And that was 150 million years ago. Hoo-wee, dee, dee, that's a long time. So pollinators have been here for a while, you know, and I think that uh, it's very important to understand at what point they, they existed. Now, 80 million years ago, we'll just, uh, we'll get to this point. 80 million years ago, I'm sorry, I'm kind of making you the, the backstop here. Um, 80 million years ago, um, the Rocky Mountains formed. Okay, that was 80 million years ago. Now, why would they form? Well, remember the plate tectonics. You've seen India. If you look at the ocean floor maps, the bathymetry it's called, the, the bottom of the ocean, where India is, you see skid marks that look like it hit the uh, Indian subcontinent, the Asian continent, right? Well, those are real. That's actually a leftover remnant of when the, that Indian subcontinent plate actually moved forward and hit that Asian plate, bringing up the Himalayan mountains. That collision over time, millions of years, brought about those mountains, that crunching together, you know, raised stuff. Because it doesn't have anywhere to go, so it has to go up. You know? And the mountains used to be very jagged and ragged, and over time they weathered, like the Appalachians in New England are, are now weathered. But they used to be a little more jagged too. You know? The Rockies are still relatively young. <laughs> okay? And that 80 million years is pretty young for these. And so that ended up being a place where we ended up, you know, we ended up seeing how tectonics causes things in action like that. Now, moving forward, we come to a very important asterisk. That's an asterisk. Very important here. This is where dinosaurs were rendered extinct by the Yucatan impact. We call that the Chicxulub impact, 65 million years ago. And we've identified the asteroid that actually caused it. The asteroid actually came from our inner asteroid belt. Now, we have a lot of asteroids that are actually in the Earth's orbit, believe it or not. The Apollos and the Trojans, those are all, they're not teams. <laughs> okay, they're actually, well, they are, some are. I mean, they're actually in the Earth's orbit as uh, asteroids that are in stable orbits. And some of them are what are called Earth crossers. They actually cross our orbit and, and can be, a, a, they're called near-Earth objects. And there's a big catalog of these, but the ones that we can't count on all right, are the ones that come about from other means, the ones that get here from the asteroid belt. When some of them get knocked out of position in the asteroid belt through collisions or whatever, they could come here. And we've identified that there's one asteroid family of asteroids, there's different families. One family of asteroids is the one that caused the dinosaur extinction, which killed 76% of the life. They call it the Cretaceous Paleogene Boundary. It used to be called the KT Boundary Event. Okay, the dinosaurs were killed 65 million years ago. That one works. Okay, well, at this point in time, this asteroid came from a member of a group called Florians, F-L-O-R-I-A-N-S, Florians. 
And the Florians were a family that's in the inner asteroid belt, you know, up, out in the asteroid belt beyond Mars and before Jupiter. Okay. Now, people wonder, like, how, much, how many uh, uh, asteroids are out there in the, in the asteroid belt, and what's the total mass? Were they a planet that disintegrated at one point? Okay. I talked to a gentleman earlier today who uh, thought maybe that, that was a possibility. And I said, well, you know, we've added up the mass of all the asteroids, and they add up to less than a quarter of the size of the moon. That's it. The total size of the asteroid belt is a quarter of the size of the moon. OK, then maybe there's some we don't know. OK, sure. So a quarter of the size of the moon plus a couple more. Even if you make it 5,000 more, it's not going to add up to a lot of mass, because we, we know all the big ones now. And you know, asteroid series makes up for one third of the mass of the asteroid belt. So you know, now that said, okay, when this Florian asteroid hit the Earth, it caused the age of the reptiles to come to an end. And guess who was waiting in the wings? Those little scurrying mammals. You know, in a sense, we sort of came from voles. You know, they sort of went away. Okay, all right, and you know as. As we move forward, okay, this, at this point here, and look, we're at the end. At this point here, this guy's saying, oh, thank God we're at the end. Um, at this point here, this is where India actually collides with Asia, all right, at this point. And that's, what's this, what is this point? This point is sheet three. This was uh, uh, 40 million years ago. So actually, India did not collide with the Asian subcontinent to form the Himalayan mountains until well after the dinosaurs were already dead. That's interesting. You see, the, the chronology is very important here, you know. So, and there's a point to telling you all of this history that's even overriding all of this that, that's coming. And I think you'll, you'll appreciate it, I hope. Now, after this collision here, uh, global cooling begins for the first time. Okay, I just lied. There were two points in our history, okay, way down there, where the Earth was entirely glaciated. We call it Snowball Earth. It's a point in time where we had a uh, change in the climate based on the young sun at the time. Because okay, the sun formed 4.6 billion years ago, just like we did. And it went through a, a lot of different changes. And as it went through changes, things happened here on the planet that made things less tenable for anything. And so we ended up having this snowball Earth occur. Now, um, that was twice. But then over here, uh, global cooling began for all the other reasons global cooling begins. And that was. Uh, because of you know, changes in vegetation, changes in uh, the sun's energy over time as well. And because of all that, um, we ended up having uh, a few things happen. And I'm going to tell you about them right now here. This is sheet two now. And by the way, we're at the end of sheet one. That's where we are. OK? And we're at sheet two. I'm waiting to hear this. OK? So, ah. Oh, he's kidding me. <laughs> so this is what's being published. <laughs> no. So, when we look at, this was uh, 23 million years ago. This is the uh, end of the, uh, you know, the uh, uh, Cretaceous Paleogene. This point here, where global cooling begins, all right? Each of these sheets, by the way, is about 15 million years, just so you know. So when we get about here, okay, and the end of the Cretaceous Paleogene of, you know, occurs, that's the beginning of the, of the Cretaceous Paleogene is right like, uh, you know, the uh, Jurassic ends here, and then we have the Cretaceous Paleogene start right when the dinosaurs were rendered extinct. And that goes for a few million years. And at the point where the, where the tertiary period started, don't worry about the names, just, just get the big picture. This is where we have the first ice at our poles after snowball Earths, okay? This is the first time we had ice at the North and South Pole, all right, was, was here. And that was uh, 25 million years ago here. And then 23 million years ago is when the tertiary period started. Now, uh, in that time, while the ice was building up, it was actually the North Pole, uh, the South Pole was also cooling, and the, the ice was fully entrenched at the South Pole. Uh, here on sheet one, where we are today, okay, uh, was fully entrenched as first Antarctic ice uh, somewhere around six million years ago, six and a half million years ago, okay? Now, before that, or just after that, rather, 10 million years ago, this is where the Red Sea opened up. Plate tectonics, always going for it. Now the big the, the continental drift, and we ended up with the Red Sea right here. All right. Now there's a little line, right, right here. I know you can't see it too well, and it's kind of intentional, but it's a little line that's right there before where we are in this room today, right here. 
that little tiny line right there next to this line where we are today corresponds to Lucy, Australopithecus afarensis, walking around in Olduvai Gorge just at 4.4 million years ago. All right? Now, I compressed the scale near the end because there's so much stuff going on, but this tells you how far away Lucy was from us today. Look at the rest of the timeline, and you see the massive history of this planet outlined. And then you actually get how long things took to occur and how ancient history, the death of the dinosaurs, is recent history. It just happened as far as the planet's concerned. That realization is what's going to stick with you when you walk out of here today. That the history of this planet that you think is ancient really isn't so ancient after all. Dinosaurs are 18 inches from us <laughs> on 117 feet, okay? 18 inches away. Think about it. And that, that's really important. Now, uh, so beyond that, we have modern man, we have Neanderthal, we have uh, Homo erectus, and you know, the missing link between Homo habilis and Homo erectus you know, has actually been found. They finally found the missing link. I'm not it. <laughs> but the bottom line is, now I'm going to tell you something about this giant timeline that we have before us. Let's suppose we're a spacefaring race. We were formed 4.6 billion years ago, way down there. The universe is 13.8 billion years old. So what's that mean? That means 13.8 billion years old means that over 9 billion years of universe existed before we ever did. So knowing that we have found planets that are actually 12.6 billion years old in our search for exoplanets, I save that for the end too, you know, I've been talking about it here. Knowing that we found planets that old means that planetary formation has been occurring since way before we were even formed. And that means that the chance of life, very exotic looking life, or life kind of like us, maybe life not like us, would have actually taken place uh, possibly elsewhere in the universe and then made their way here, anywhere along our timeline. So if the universe existed for 9 billion years, that's more than enough time for a species to go intergalactic or inter, you know, uh, extragalactic even, leave the galaxy, go around to other galaxies. So if that's the case, when people say to me, I don't believe in UFOs, it's like, oh, well, how can you avoid not, how can you say that? If you look at the factual data, the factual data says, we're not even young enough in this universe to even understand ourselves yet. And nine billion years of universe, almost you know, twice the length of time we've been here, came before us. So we, anywhere along this timeline, could have been found, discovered, and people could have, you know, beings could have come here, stayed here, made a home here, left here, and then finally came back or something. Now we find today, and I think it's sort of, it's sort of arrogant of us to think how nowadays, how we're only, uh, only now seeing that uh, you know, UFOs are visiting us now. It's like, well, what do you mean? What, what's the difference between now and you know, a billion years ago? Nothing. An alien race that's got that kind of knowledge and capability to travel interstellar, which by the way, NASA's already exploring because we think we're about 100 years from actually going interstellar. Oh yeah. And we can go to Alpha Centauri, the nearest star system, 4.3 light years away. Currently it would take us 12,000 years to get there at the fastest speed we know. But if we go with this new system NASA's developing called the Alcubierre, uh, Froning Alcubierre Drive, if we get there with that, we'll get there in five days. That's kind of a little better. And it's not even a toll road, okay? <laughs> so let me tell you, that this development that took us this way, even now, in this little tiny sliver of time that we've existed, I'll, I'll tell you this, our modern history, the, the, the recorded history that we, that we have, from the time we started recording our history, was about 5,000 years until now. That's uh, ancient Samaria and the cuneiform tablature language, tablet language. That time frame till now, is like I said, that's our basic frame of reference for when we actually started recording history, and when humans actually recorded history. That being said, 
The cuneiform language is very important because it points something out to us. In that 5,000 years, we went from pecking rocks to make the tablets to landing on Mars with rovers. And by the way, Mars is the only planet fully inhabited by robots. Just thought I'd let you know. You know? <laughs> yeah. um, and in that time, we've gone you know, across the gamut from pecking rocks to landing on Mars and seeing Pluto. All right. And in that amount of time, we already see over our horizons, and I've said this to a number of you, just over our horizon, we see the ability to go interstellar very quickly. And beyond that horizon, there's another one where we're going to be able to go throughout the galaxy in a manner and a speed that is going to take us not to a distant star that's 10,000 light years away in, say, uh, five years but in just a few minutes. And you go like, what? What? That's science fiction. Oh, what? Yeah, so were cell phones. Okay? But everything we can think of has come to pass. Science fiction, science fiction has become science fact. I think that this history of the Earth shows us that anywhere along the line here, aliens could find us. And guess what? If we're looking for exoplanets, we're going to find an exoplanet that could be anywhere along this developmental line, too. So, you see, it's really... Uh, a universe full of possibility. Uh, and that's why I call it a populated universe. All right? And that's the name of my book, which isn't out yet. Uh, so you can't buy it, not yet. But if you ever want it, we'll have it available maybe next time, maybe next year. But the point being that this timeline is how I want to acquaint you uh, with the history of the Earth in a way that you'll actually remember. And if you take nothing away, just take away that dinosaurs are 18 inches away. Say to your friends, Dinosaurs were only 18 inches from us, you know. And they'll go, wow, you know, and they'll say, uh, okay, that person's lost their mind. But in any case, I just want to thank you for your incredible indulgence, and I want to thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much.